For me, on this hunt here in Southeast Alaska, the guy I've known for quite a while, Jim Bagedell, has been asking me, Randy, when are you coming up here to hunt alpine blacktails? If you want to go on a super, super blacktail hunt, you can go with certain people. And for me, I'm fortunate to have a friend in Jim Bagedell that not only is he a great guy, but he knows more about blacktails than probably any person around. If you hunt with somebody and you watch them, you can say, this guy knows the habit to those animals. This guy's got it figured out. And watching Jim do that, there was no doubt he knew what that buck was thinking, what that buck was afraid of, how that buck was reading the wind. And I think he got within, I don't know, 50 yards. And he just put his big muzzle loader on his knee and boom. And hunting with somebody like that is, to me, is a huge part of the experience. It's why I love to hunt with people like Jim. I learn so much. As Jim and I were walking down the hill, our packs are heavy and we're carrying his deer back down to camp. And I'm just thinking to myself, looking around like, I can't believe I'm here. I cannot believe that I got to watch Jim shoot that buck with that muzzleloader the way he did. What an amazing place. But now the anticipation is in front of me because now it's my turn. Now it's Randy's turn to do something he's dreamed of for years. Years and years I've dreamed about hunting Sitka Blacktail. And Jim and I talked about doing this last winter. And in the interim, I came up to Southeast Alaska, just about 70 miles north of here, and did a bear hunt. So my buddy Bart May and I, we come up in May, he shoots a great black bear. And he's walking around the island where Camp Town, he's like, oh, there's a dead mule deer carcass, a skeleton laying out there in the, in the grass right along the shoreline. I'm like, oh, really? mule deer and Bart's a mule deer hunter he's never been to southeast Alaska he doesn't know anything about blacktail and he brings it back to camp and I'm like holy cow Bart that is huge we found this buck Bart did it's a Boone and Crockett buck and I've got all summer to just sit and think about this buck and it's gonna make me dream about the upcoming hunt man if I can find a buck like this in August, up here in the high alpine, wow. I get back to Montana. I take it to the Boone and Crockett headquarters in Missoula, Montana, and they score it. And it's the number six Boone and Crockett non-typical Sitka blacktail of all time. And that's even after the rodents chewed an inch off here, an inch off there. And so all summer I've been looking at this skull I brought back that Bart had found up here. And I have no expectations that I'm gonna shoot a buck like that, but it just got me so excited thinking about Sitka Blacktail, Sitka Blacktail. So the anticipation of walking down that hill and know that, all right, Randy, you're no longer on deck, you're in the batter's box. That night I'm laying in bed, I'm laying in my tent, and I can hardly sleep. I'm hoping the weather breaks. I'm hoping the deer continue to cooperate because we have seen so many deer. We've seen deer on the green hillsides. We've seen deer on the skylines. We've seen them when it's cloudy. We've seen them when it's sunny. And we've seen some, some bucks that have no velvet. They've rubbed it all. We've seen other bucks in full velvet. We've seen some that are scraping and rubbing and, and trying to get rid of their velvet. We've seen it all. And it's like, someone brought me to the paradise of Sitka blacktail hunting. And the person who brought me here is my buddy, Jim Bagedell. And I can't thank him enough for it. But now, Randy, the, the question becomes, what are you gonna do? 
Are you just gonna shoot the first buck you see because you know you got a tight weather window and you gotta be out of here the next morning? Are you gonna be picky? What are you gonna do? <sighs> I woke up this morning. I decided to do some glassing right from camp. <clears throat> and one of the nice four by fours we've been watching that was way high on the mountain. It's about halfway on the mountain right now, so I'm gonna run and see if I can get close enough for a shot. Wish me luck, because I'm gonna need it. I'll get out to shoot straight. I'm almost embarrassed to say this, because after how hard we worked, the four hour climb we did to get to Jim's buck, I get out of the tent in the morning and I look up on the mountain and there's been this really nice, heavy, beautiful, perfect, symmetrical four by four. He'd been way up on the mountain and wouldn't you know, I look and that buck is now way down the mountain. I'm like, no, that, that can't be, that's just too lucky. Tyler and I just took off and we, I don't know, there's part of me that felt bad just leaving Jim behind there, but uh, we got, a, a, our, our camp is here and then it's just this sheer wall out in front of us. It's about 300 yards across the meadow and then a sheer wall. We get over towards almost, we're at the base of that sheer wall and it becomes obvious to me if we get any closer to that wall, we're not gonna, our angle, we're not gonna be able to see that buck because there's so much brush. What looks like nice little green meadows are really piles of just terrible jungle brush about 10 feet high that you gotta swim through, fight through. So you can't shoot through it. He knows we're right here. He's got the commanding view. He's looking right at us. And I tell Tyler, I'm like, I'm looking, I'm like, gosh, I, I don't know, I range it. Man, right here, 200, I think 83 yards or something like that. And, and so the there, there was this little dead, looks like Christmas tree there. Take my hiking staff, jam it in there, and now there's a crotch there where I'm almost bench, bench rest solid. Right now he's behind a bunch of brush. He's at 283 yards. I got this perfect rest right here, both front and back. We're not gonna get a better opportunity than this if he steps out. But right now he's obscured by brush, so I don't dare shoot, he's broadside. We're not gonna get a better opportunity than this if he steps out. But right now he's obscured by brush, so I don't dare shoot, he's broadside. Him. How can that be? I had to have hit him. There he's down.
150 yards from camp. <laughs> the buck was obscured by brush from my angle at first. And it, if I don't know if it'll even show in the footage, but there's still some brush in front of him, slight amounts. And the very first shot, I'm just dead solid, perfect. And all of just, Come on, buddy. And he steps out just a little bit, clears what, at least what I could see in the scope had cleared the brush. And I shot and instantly he buckled and he starts coming back down the hill, put another one in, boom, boom. And he didn't go 10 yards after the second shot. And he starts rolling down the hill, but he got caught up in one of those nests of absolute garbage and junk. And, Fine shoot. Ooh, well, look, someone built the bench rest for me. It's amazing. You cannot, uh, the, I'm, I'm sturdier right here than I am on most sandbags. <laughs> and I, I got to this, I'm like, you know what? If we get closer, I'm gonna have a steeper angle, 283 yards. I think I can handle that. And- uh, You hit him both times. Did I? I? I thought I did. They felt really good, but. Oh, what a pretty shot. What an incredible animal. Oh man, so incredible. What a place. What a place. That, that's, you know, once you get here, the killing deer is the easy part. It's the getting here that's enough to wipe you out. Holy cow. Extracting that buck was way more work than the shooting him. Which a lot of times, whether it's elk, whether it's whatever, the shooting them's the easy part. Mighty nice of you to drop your breakfast and come and help out here, Jim. That's not required, but. And getting that buck off the mountain was a pain. <clears throat> this might make for some interesting footage. I thought this was a nice little grassy meadow, Jim. I didn't know your grass and ferns grew up to my armpits. First I said my crotch and then we got in it. Now I'm at my armpits. No kidding. No. Ah. When you think about coming to a beautiful place like this, a place that is so rich, so vibrant, so almost untouched by the hand of man, and you can have that kind of experience, I don't know how, how you put a value on that. To come here and do this, and a lot of you might think, oh, that's something you gotta do with a guide or an outfitter. You don't. Ooh. Why did he only fall this far? Oh, and we got this alder right there in the way. Hold on. Oh, oh right here. That's why he wasn't going anywhere. Perfect front shoulder shot. Thanks for all your help, Jim. <laughs> Was it worth the effort? <laughs> Was it worth the effort? Uh, yeah, it is. That is a beautiful buck. Full velvet. Absolutely symmetrical. Yeah, there's not a lot of... I always say I want big or ugly. In, in a pinch, no, I always say ugly then big. In a pinch, we'll go with pretty. Now, we gotta get this buck, Jim's buck, back down to the beach. And uh, it took us six hours to get up here with heavy camp loads. It was nine hours back down the last time. Nine hours down last time? You heard it here, folks. <laughs> May this not be my last trip 
to the blacktail country of Alaska. It was my first, hopefully not my last. So now that we've got two bucks down, our packs are full. We know we gotta be to the beach the next morning because on his sat phone, Jim has called and got the weather report and they said, hey, we've got this little window. You better be on the beach tomorrow morning. <laughs> and so we're looking at each other like, we gotta haul two deer and all of our gear down this ugly, nasty slope that took us six hours to get up here. You take two boned out deer, their heads, their capes, everything else, all of our camp gear, all of our production gear, and all three of us have loads over 120 pounds. And you're going down this steep, ugly, nasty, brushy stuff. Sometimes you gotta turn and face the, the slope and just grab and work your way down, facing the slope. And I'm falling and I'm tripping and I'm, I mean, I came up with some new cuss words, so I'm pretty sure the audio of us going down to the beach is not usable. And you get to a point where you're so frustrated because you're making such slow progress and the weight on your back and your knees and your shoulders and everything and you're sweating and you're just like, I want to get the hell out of here. I got to get to that beach. And you try taking these shortcuts and you cliff out and you got to backtrack. You try this way and it just, until you go and do it, you really can't understand how frustrating it is. Jungle. Ugh. My thought that it's only gonna take four hours to get down here. No, it took six and a half. <laughs> and quite honestly, my greatest fulfillment of getting to the beach was Nobody got hurt. <laughs> and as I'm sitting on the beach, I, uh, there's a part of me where my body is saying, oh, don't do that to me again for a while. And we built a fire, we set our camp, we put the tenderloins on the fire that night. And we're just sitting there along the ocean beach. And I didn't really say anything to Jim or to Tyler, but there wasn't a pain in my body. Only two hours earlier, I was cussing the hill, I was cussing the devil's clubs. I was upset at the frustrations of carrying this heavy load for so far and now just two hours later watching these tenderloins roast over the fire my mind was back up in the alpine my mind was rolling forward to i can't wait to come and do this next year a remarkable experience is one where the pain is forgotten so quickly the frustrations and the struggles are gone from your memory the minute you're done. And it's nothing but, I can't wait to do it the next time. If there's one thing about this hunt that all of you are gonna watch, I, I suspect it's gonna be the beauty, the greenness, the high alpine, probably some of the challenge and the size of the deer. But for me, I, I don't know if I have the words to properly say it, but I felt like Jim, trusted me enough to say, Randy, your appreciation for these places, your appreciation for public lands, I admire that and I'm gonna take you to my, I'm gonna call it to his sacred grounds, to his place that he wants to keep as that. He, he's always working and advocating to keep those lands the way they are for the blacktail. And it's a special time, it's a special moment when you realize that somebody has went from, well, I know this guy, I've known him for four or five years, but I've never hunted with him, to over the course of three or four days of fighting and struggling and, and working together to accomplish something. When that's all over, that person trusts you enough to say, hey, this, 
I, I'm glad I shared this with you, Randy. I'm glad that you had the opportunity to experience this. And in that process, I hope, I dearly hope, that Jim and I get to continue to build on this friendship from here. And if it involves Sitka black-tailed deer, I can't think of a better way to build a friendship than the islands of Southeast Alaska in the Alpine chasing velvet blacktails.